Hello, I am Fernando Villalba, tech evangelizer at Humanitech. Today, I'm going to talk to you about how to make an internal development platform that your users would love. For me, this is about the developer experience. And in this case, we're going to talk about the user experience of the tools that you're using to improve that developer experience. And we are aiming to solve this problem. This was a popular post in Reddit that someone posted some time ago where someone just spent months building a platform and devs hate it. Help me understand why. Hopefully this talk will help understand why or how you can make a platform that doesn't suck. First, I want to make this differentiation here. UX is not the same as UI. Some people get them confused, but for me, user experience encompasses the entire user experience. Well, not just for me, in general, like that's the, the actual definition of user, user experience. And when you, when you think about great user experience, you generally think of great design. One example here, I would say that Amazon delivers a spectacular user experience when it comes to delivery, but sometimes, in my experience at least, Prime Video hasn't always been as good as Netflix, for example. Like sometimes I'm browsing through the menus and I press back and I'm sent to something that I wasn't looking at before or, you know, the subtitles are out, are out of sync, etc., etc. Not to say that it is bad, but it's not as good as the prime delivery, in my opinion. So good design is great communication. Great design is intuitive. It communicates clearly the intent of the tool without the aid of communication. Of documentation and this is quite important because RDFM kind of sucks I mean this is read the FM manual and you see it a lot over and over again engineers telling to each other oh you know you should RDFM you know you should read the manual and sometimes it's, it has it has a good um, intentions behind it but Sometimes it also feels like people who lean too heavily on this end up being lazy on the design and then creating a lazy design that actually ends up in a very clunky manual for the user to read and use. And I want to show you a simple example of what it means to have like this RTFN driven design. And it's quite funny. And I promise you that this video is not a joke. It's actually a real video showing you how to use a tool, uh, light bulb in this case. Welcome to CBYGE Smart Tips. We're going to show you how to factory reset your CBYGE bulbs, which will unpair your bulb from other devices and apps that it's connected to. There are two factory reset processes, which depend on the generation of bulbs and the firmware you're running on. Here's the first process, designed for bulbs with this package or for firmware version 2.8 or later. Start with your bulb off for at least five seconds. Then turn on the bulb for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds. Turn on for eight seconds. Turn off for two seconds, and then turn it on one last time. The bulb will flash on and off three times to show that the reset was successful. If it doesn't, your bulb may be running on an older version of firmware, and will need to try the second factory reset process. So as you saw in that video, I mean, it's not, it's not exactly the kind of experience that you want for your users and you know it's not the kind of experience that you would want for your internal development platform so 
RDFN driven design piles the burden of responsibility of usability on the user. And this is exactly what I mean by that. When you design a product or you pick a product that takes minimal amount of the complexity burden, your user is going to be unhappy because they're going to have to do the extra work that the tool doesn't do. But when your product or your tool does takes on most of this complexity burden, then the user is going to be happier in the end. To create an intuitive tool, I'd say you should design with the weakest, sillier user in mind. You have to think that there are no bad users. There is just bad design. And what I mean by this is that we all have our silly moments. And you want to have a design that protects you from silly mistakes and is also very intuitive. So when you grab the tool, you can understand how it works and you can use it as easy as possible. And you always have to remember that internal development platforms are complex. I mean, there are many tools, but you can always compartmentalize them into multiple users, multiple personas. So you can deliver experience based on these personas, which is what we're saying here. And this is a good way for you to get to the bottom of why a design is not working. If you see that your users are struggling with something, just keep asking why and keep going as far back as possible to the design that is making your users like confused about how to use the tool. Never stop at the user, keep going and see if you can solve it at the same time. So a few words on design and beauty. Beautiful design is important to attract your users. It will make it more palatable for them. It will make more attractive whatever tool you have. If you have a nice presentation, nice design, but it may not keep them around. So, and I'm saying this here because sometimes people, when they associate design, they think, oh, something beautiful, something pretty, but that's not always the case. It helps, but it's not the only thing that we're talking about here. So now I'm going to talk about some elements of design that you can learn and leverage in order to make your platform better. So first we're going to talk about features and I argue here that you should have quality of features over quantity. So there is a flexibility and usability trade-off. If you have a lot of features, your tool is going to be more flexible, but it's also going to be a lot less usable. And I like to use this example here because I bought this TV, this Samsung TV that had two remotes. And the one at the bottom that you see there, the really complex one, no one at the house ever used it. Even though you have lots of features in it, it does more than the other one, but the other one was just so much handle to use. And the complex features that you needed to access that the other one offers, you could just go via contextual menus because they're not that commonly used features. So this is one example where you can leverage certain level of, of abstraction for your more complex features that you don't use as much. And you can create a clean user interface for your users to easily use. And again, you can leverage the Pareto principle here. Just implement first the features that are gonna be the most used. Get some feedback from your users. Now, signifiers, whenever you are designing something and you're not able to effectively convey how to use the tool just with the design itself, you can add a small signifier. This is a good example. You have a signifier that tells you like how, how, run, how often this uh, cron job runs. And I think it's uh, quite elegant and quite simple. You just hover over it and it shows you that. And it's quite good. This is, a, this is a funny example I saw on Reddit. Someone was chastising these users that wrote these reviews because they were too dumb to know that, you know, you just have to remove this protective film. And while I can kind of agree with that, I think that whoever was selling this product was making the assumption that everyone is going to have that previous experience with peeling protective films. This could have been very easily solved with putting a little tag on the side of that protective film that said peel here and it would have solved that problem. So whenever you're designing a tool or you're designing application, 
you know, you'll, you always have to think where you should put those signifiers to help your users without them having to actually read the documentation. Feedback is usually what you get when you interact with a tool, like for example, when you're charging something and it goes from red to green, you know that it's fully charged. And when you're running a command, in this case, it's telling you everything that is happening and then it gives you a command that you can run and it gives you a link that you can follow. I think this is very neat. Or if you have an error, it tells you, oh, maybe you meant this, or it may tell you what the problem may be. I think this is excellent, especially when you're using command line tools or when you're dealing with uh, logs. An application may send a log, giving you feedback, what the problem may be and where you can look at. It even saves you from going to Google. I think good feedback beats this. This is another popular meme, which I don't particularly agree with because, I mean, Anyone that has to deal with an outage knows that, you know, reading five minutes of documentation is going to solve you from that outage. Sometimes it may, if you know the, the, the tool beforehand, and I think it's good that you read the documentation that you're familiar with it, but it is not a substitute for having good design and good feedback and all of that. I think for me, the, 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 the good structure would be this. First, you have the sign. The sign is the most important. Then you go to a signifier, add signifiers, then you get feedback. And then at the very end is your documentation. Documentation is also very important. And I'm not being facetious here. Sometimes if you're using tools that are very complex, you're always going to need documentation. Sometimes a lot of documentation. But I think that comes last. The sign is always first. And remember, your document, the, 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 the worse your design is, the chunkier your documentation is going to be. Conceptual models is the way that your users see things. Whenever you design something, don't cater to the way you understand things. Cater to the one that your users understand the world. So, for example, this is an, the, the example on the left is um, Jenkins. Jenkins out of the box has this blue balls that tell you that a deployment has been done correctly. And the most popular add-on, the most popular uh, plugin for, for Jenkins is one that turns those into green because that's what people understand as okay, green color, not blue. Blue came from like the, the original creator of Jenkins being Japanese, but yeah, it's, it's definitely not a conceptual model that most people are used to. And then on the right is this example, this joke, this meme, which I can kind of agree with. AWS naming their things, that, you know, they're not that intuitive to get. But Azure just names the products for what they are, and the same with GCP, which makes it easier to um, to know what you're dealing with. It makes it easier for your users to, to get familiar with it. Feature constraints and persona constraints. Uh, feature constraints, I mean, the, the example here on the left is, uh, is from Mario Bros, the first game. And I'm using that as an example because I think video games sometimes are examples of great design. Because you cannot afford to have like crappy design with video games and be successful. Well, someone may disagree, but most games are well designed, do well. And... Mario is an excellently designed game, and here is an example. Whenever you get the mushroom, if it is the first time you're playing the, the game, you wouldn't know if that is an enemy or if that's something that, an item that gives you a power-up. So if you're trying to dodge the mushroom here, the block on top will push you back down, so you always get that mushroom. This is an example of using constraints to lead the player to do what you want it to do. So you can leverage these constraints in your application to get users to do what they need to do. And these constraints can help them to stop like doing something stupid, something dangerous. And you can also use persona constraints in order to, to deliver the best possible features for whatever users are you're catering for. So an internal development platform will have multiple users, so you can use personas in order to leverage a better user experience for them. So, internal development platforms are composed of multiple tools. You can create some of them by others. Understanding what good design is helps with both. 
So you should always understand what, what good design and not just focus on numbers and features. Especially don't just focus on number of features, also focus on what good design is. Because ultimately, good user experience is going to make the life of your developers and your users in general a lot better. And it will probably yield software faster. So where does Humanitech fit in? Humanitech sits at the center of your internal development platform to help your platform engineers deliver the perfect level of abstractions for your developers. So basically it takes care of standardization by design for you by ensuring that every deployment has all the correct infrastructure and configuration. So if we look at these graphs right here, you have a developer uh, sitting on top here, defines workloads and resource dependencies with a score workload specification, which is a simple file saying, I need this resource and I need this workload to be deployed. And the platform orchestrator will actually create all of that for that workload and it will inject all the configuration and do all, all of those dependencies based on what a platform engineer sets up. So a platform engineering can actually deliver a good user experience for a developer. And this is where the this is an internal this is an internal development platform on GCP. All of these tools make up one internal development platform. And you have platform orchestrator at the center, you have an identified registry and uh, monitoring and all of that. So whenever you are designing your internal development platform, you have to look at what your users are going to interact with and ideally pick tooling that is easy to use because that in the long run is definitely going to help your developer experience much more than picking tools that are very complicated and take a lot of steps to do something and you have to read a lot of documentation and you know it just slows down development in general and that's pretty much it from me now this uh, was a very long talk uh, if you want to read more on ux and platform engineering you can search for ux platform engineering and the top result as it is for now, is mine, and there are there are um, there are references to books there that you can check out, and there's more information there that I that I wrote. And if you have any questions or you want to have a chat or whatever, just talk to me on LinkedIn, or you can find me in the Platform Engineering channel. Thank you very much for your time.